Secret virtual queue drops, the reality of Genie Plus, and free park tickets? Disney World might not be the theme park you thought it was. Hey everybody, it's AJ for Disney Food Vlog. So Disney World is not your average theme park vacation. It's got rides and shows and overpriced soft pretzels that you always find yourself wishing were just a little bit warmer, but it's also a vacation that you're gonna have to start planning for way in advance. Just cause there's so much that goes into a Disney World Resort getaway and so much money that you spend on it that you may not realize how critical that planning is. And that goes for ticket prices, travel, crowds, lightning lanes. But I'm getting ahead of myself here. We're definitely gonna talk about all all those Disney World realizations and more today, but we're also gonna do it in a way where the light bulb clicks for you instead of keeping you in the dark. So let's get to it. First up, this one's kind of mathy, so get ready. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna pay for a range of tickets. Want to save money on your Disney World park tickets? Then you might want to choose to pay for your tickets on a day that's earlier than your first park visit. Yeah, it's confusing. Let's clear things up. When you pay for park tickets, you're not actually paying a different price for each specific day. You're paying for a range of days. Let's use an example for three-day tickets purchased in the month of August 2024. Each day of the month featured on Disney's price ticket calendar will have different starting costs. Cost. Now watch what happens when we click on one of those calendar days. For a three-day park ticket, you'll actually be paying for a five-day range that you can use those park tickets during. This means you can use your park tickets back to back immediately or give yourself a little break between days. Just as long as you use all three park tickets before that range ends, you're good to go. So how can this save you money? Because the amount you pay for that range of tickets for each day is all based on your first selected day. So back to the calendar. Let's say I wanna visit the parks on August 21st, 22nd, and 23rd. If I select August 21st as the start day for my ticket, then I'll have to pay $124 per person per day. But if I rely on that five day ticket range, I can select my starting price for August 19th, which is $118 per person per day, but still has a range that covers the days I actually wanna visit the parks. I'll just be saving a bit of money by selecting the cheaper start date. Note, this tip is only gonna work if you're buying tickets on their own. If you're buying a vacation package, it'll lock you into the days of your hotel reservation for the start date of your ticket. Okay, so this may not seem like a big deal to you if you're in the Disney World planning honeymoon phase and don't plan on backing out of your trip for nothing, but things happen. Life happens, there are storms, there are sicknesses, there are dozens of things that could force you into a corner where you need to back out of your Disney World vacation. And while for the most part, Disney reservations for things like hotels and restaurants can be canceled if you cancel soon enough, you'll just have to check those Disney cancellation policies on the website, Disney World park tickets are pretty unforgiving. Disney World tickets are non-transferable and non-refundable, so very scary words there. You cannot cancel a ticket or get your money back for it. And that can really feel like salt in an open wound when you're already bummed about postponing your trip in the first place. With that being said though, don't worry, we've got a solution. Disney does warn that while you cannot cancel or get a refund for tickets or packages, you may be able to change the date of your unused tickets. You can often use unexpired tickets in the future just as long as the first date has not already been used. But you'll need to change the date of an unused standard theme park ticket via the Disney World website. If you're picking a different date to use your park tickets in the future and said future date happens to be during a more expensive time of year, don't sweat it. You'll just have to pay the price difference between your original ticket date versus the new ticket date instead of paying for all new park tickets. So in short, you can't go back on a Disney ticket purchase once it's been made, but Disney will work to accommodate you if you need to push back your Disney vacation to a later time. Now, I'm not ashamed to admit I've probably had one too many breakdowns trying to get over to the transportation and ticket center after a full day at Magic Kingdom. It just happens, especially when it's raining. Doesn't matter how many times you've been to the parks, exhaustion and frustration comes for us all. So let me walk you through what it's like to park and depart from Magic Kingdom when you're not planning on using Disney transportation. First things first, unlike the other parks that have their parking lot right next to their entrances so that you can walk in all easy peasy, Magic Kingdom collects all its guests in a massive set of parking lots that are over a mile away from the actual theme park. 
So once you park your car, you're only at the start of your journey to get to Magic Kingdom. This was what Walt wanted, everybody. He, he wanted to separate the park because over in Disneyland, he didn't do that. And so people were kind of bombarded with the real world when they were inside his fantasy park. And he hated that. And what he wanted with Magic Kingdom is that nothing could come close or impinge on your fantasy experience in his park. And you wouldn't kind of see the real real world. That's why Magic Kingdom is so far away from the parking lot. Anyway, after either parking in the hero section or the villain section of the lot, you can ride a tram or walk up to that infamous little area, the Transportation and Ticket Center, or TTC for short. At least there's a Joffrey's Coffee kiosk there, makes things a little better. At the TTC though, you will have to go through a security checkpoint before it's time for you to make another crucial decision. Now you're gonna have to hop on board the monorail or the ferry boat. Then and only then will you finally reach the front gates of the park where you can scan your ticket or magic band and head on in. And as tedious as this procedure sounds, just think about having to do it all over again in reverse at the end of the night after you've had a full park day and literally every single person in that park is trying to do the same thing. Like I said, one too many breakdowns to count. Now, if you're planning on driving to Magic Kingdom and you want to cut down on your transportation and ticket center travel time as much as possible at the end of your day, you've got two options to consider. You can either ditch early or stick things out until the bitter end. If you ditch early, that is before the fireworks, the transportation and ticket center crowds are going to be much lighter, meaning quicker travels back to your car. But if you don't want to skip happily ever after, just hang out in Magic Kingdom and wait for those initial exiting crowds to die down. Once you hit closing time, Magic Kingdom's Main Street USA shops will remain open for at least another half hour or longer, depending on the day, while you continue to exit the park. So find a place to sit, take it easy, wait out the bulk of the crowds while you bask in the glow of Cinderella Castle for just a second longer. There will come a point where Main Street starts looking a lot more like a street again rather than a sea of people, and that'll be your cue to finally leave the park and head on over to the ferry or monorail. Also, don't forget that Disney's minivan service will also pick you up and drop you off at the front of Magic Kingdom too. While regular rideshare services like Uber and Lyft will still be required to go through the Transportation and Ticket Center to collect their guests, minivans are the only rideshare that's allowed to pick up their guests near the buses right outside the Magic Kingdom gates. You can book a minivan for an additional fee through the Lyft app once you're on Disney property. I always recommend, again, kind of leaving Magic Kingdom a little bit early because at that end of the night time, everybody else is trying to book a minivan too. So you can leave a little bit early and have a better chance of getting a minivan in a decent period of time. You might try scheduling a minivan. I'll have to test that out and see if you can actually do that at the end of the night at Magic Kingdom. But I have run into a few issues getting a minivan kind of right when the fireworks are over, like 9, 18 p.m. trying to book a minivan. So just heads up on that. At the beginning of the year, Disney World did away with Park Pass reservations for all guests using date-based tickets. That's pretty much everybody, except folks like annual pass holders, cast members, military ticket holders, etc. Basically, if you have a date on your ticket, you're a date-based ticket holder. Now, before, Park Pass reservations could be a pain in the nether regions because you'd go to reserve your spot in the parks ahead of your trip, knowing good and well there was always a chance that a certain park would already be booked up for the day. So you'd think that by lifting the Park Pass reservations rule, you wouldn't have to worry about the parks getting all filled up anymore, right? Right? Well, not exactly. During busier times of the year, Disney's parks can still manage to reach capacity. And while we weren't always fans of the Park Pass reservations, and certainly didn't hide that fact from anyone, at least those Park Pass reservations would give us a heads up to let us know if a park was going to be at its max capacity so we could shift around our schedules. Finding out that a park is completely full when you're already in the middle of your Disney World trip is rough. Now, we don't see the parks completely fill up often, just every now and then, like when we're in the peak of spring break, for instance. But if you know you're going to Disney World during one of their historically busy seasons, here are my two cents. Make sure you get to the park you're planning on visiting that day as soon as you can, either by rope drop or by early theme park entry. If you're a Disney hotel guest, you've got that 30 minute early entry benefit. And this will help you get ahead of the peak of the crowd so you can be inside the parks before they reach capacity. 
And if the park still manages to reach capacity before you're there, don't panic just yet. You can either kill time over at a different park that's not yet at capacity if you've got a park hopper ticket to use, or you can kill time elsewhere around property like at one of the resorts or Disney Springs. Now crowds are going to ebb and flow, so even if a park reaches capacity, it can be downgraded from that level as well because people will start to leave. So you shouldn't be blocked out from entering a certain park all day long. Just be sure to call 407-560-5000, that's the park capacity hotline, to learn about current park availability. That way you don't have to make the trek all the way back over to check on a park status in person. You can just call them and they'll let you know. Now here's a little bit of real talk. You will get used to Genie Plus. We got Disney Genie Plus videos on this channel. We got detailed Disney Genie Plus posts on our website. We've even got free Disney Genie Plus cheat sheets, which you can have sent to your email right now when you scan that QR code you see on the screen or by dropping us your name and email at disneyfoodblog.com slash Disney Genie Plus. Basically, we've covered Genie Plus over and over and over again. And the reason we do that is because when you first hear about Disney Genie Plus, it can be really confusing and overwhelming and frustrating. And I'm not saying that no part of Genie Plus is convoluted, but what I am saying is if you do your research beforehand, it really isn't as complicated to use in the parks as you might initially think. Think of it like, I don't know, building a swing set. <laughs> when you first look at the instructions, things get overwhelming really fast. There are so many screws and metal parts and tools and A, B and B, A and B, C and tools you need to use. And what on earth is that thing? But when you finally dive into the swing set building process and take things one step at a time, it becomes smoother and a whole lot less overwhelming. So don't let all the Disney Genie Plus hacks and tricks and step-by-step -step procedures end up doing the opposite and making you overwhelmed. Once you get to the park after studying up on Genie Plus, the process is actually a lot more smooth sailing than you might realize and really will help you bypass those really long ride lines. So if there are three easy Genie Plus words of advice I can give to you right now that aren't overwhelming and still help you understand understand the service, here's what I've got for you. One, buy Genie Plus early. Disney Genie Plus goes on sale via the My Disney Experience app right at midnight on each day of your park visit. After you purchase the service, you won't be able to make your first Lightning Lane selection until 7 a.m., but you've got it sorted out and it won't sell out without you. Two, select one Lightning Lane at a time. The My Disney Experience app will keep you updated about when you'll be able to make your next Lightning Lane selection, but basically you can make a new one after you've just used your last one or two hours since your last Lightning Lane was selected. Now don't let this two hour rule trip you up. It's literally here to help you get your money's worth out of this service. Since Lightning Lane return times through Genie Plus will always be assigned to you. So if you select a ride with a return time that doesn't happen until later in the evening, that two hour cooldown period lets you choose another Lightning Lane to add to your collection, basically as a reward for your patience. And three, keep in mind that some Lightning Lanes require a separate purchase. I'm a visual gal, so think of Disney Genie Plus like a bag of fun size candies. For one candy bag purchase, you'll have access to multiple candies. However, if you want that premium full size candy bar, you're not gonna be able to get that in the fun size bags. You'll have to pay a separate price for those. And in this case, the full size bars include Guardians of the Galaxy, Cosmic Rewind in Epcot, Flight of Passage in Animal Kingdom, Rise of the Resistance in Hollywood Studios, and Tron Light Cycle Run and Seven Dwarfs Mine Train in Magic Kingdom. Now I'm hungry, Bria. Thank you very much for talking to me about fun size candy bars. And even those three steps can feel like a lot of info at once, but like I said, if you take the time to study up on the service before your trip, you'll start to catch on real quick once you're actually inside the parks. Now, you might have beef with the Orlando airport. Teleportation does not exist yet, unfortunately, and that stinks because that means you might have to deal with the struggles of traveling between Orlando International Airport and the Disney World bubble. Now, now don't worry, you're not going to be stranded at the Orlando airport or anything, but some of those modes of transport can be a headache, especially when you're on a time crunch or a budget or both. Take Mirrors Connect, for instance. This is a good option for going between Disney World and the airport if you're looking for a budget-friendly option. Tickets for kids are $13 each way. Adults can grab tickets for $16 each way. However, if you're in a rush to get to either location, look out. Mirrors Connect makes a lot of different stops at hotels around Disney World, so it could be over an hour until you actually get off the bus at your hotel. And then you've still got to take free Disney transportation to the park you're trying to get to. Even if you're using the new Lynx shuttle 
Jungle route, which is going to take you straight to Disney Springs for $2 from the airport, that trip will still take over an hour to complete. Not to mention, this bus runs about every 30 minutes, so if you just missed the last one, you're going to have to wait a half hour to catch the next. The layout of the airport itself also plays a part in you getting from place to place because it's huge. The layout of the Orlando airport is no joke, especially for people who are used to flying in and out of smaller airports back home. It's not just one floor, nor one terminal. You'll need to take a monorail from your gate and change floors to get to Mears Connect, a ride share service, or just to grab your bags. When in doubt, follow the signs you see around the airport or ask an employee for help if you're really lost. Don't worry, they can help you get where you're going. And if you think booking a rideshare is going to help you avoid the headache, well, it doesn't always. Sometimes it even causes a little bit more of a headache. If you're grabbing a rideshare around a busy time, like lunch or rush hour, you'll notice the prices for them will suddenly skyrocket. Unfortunately, again, there's really no way around this one other than to ensure you're booking your rideshare earlier or later than these busy times, even if it means you'll need to sit at the airport for an additional hour or so. Always better to be early than late. While you're home before your vacation begins, you can also check what times the prices around Orlando shoot up to prepare in advance. Okay, we finally have an official opening date, y'all. On June 28th, Tiana's Bayou Adventure will officially open to the public in Magic Kingdom. Upon opening, this log flume attraction will have a virtual queue put in place to help manage those initial crowds, which has become Disney's go-to strategy for managing demand for popular rides. This means Tiana's Bayou Adventure will not have a standby line when it first opens. There will be no standby line. So your only two options to ride this one when you get to the parks will be via virtual queue or using Disney Genie Plus. More on that in a second. Let's talk virtual queue first. The virtual queue for Tiana's Bayou Adventure is accessible via the My Disney Experience app and will open at 7 a.m. each morning and again at 1 p.m. each afternoon. You do not have to be in Magic Kingdom to join the 7 a.m. virtual queue drop. You can be in your hotel room bed if you want, but you do have to be inside Magic Magic Kingdom for the 1 p.m. drop. Now, Disney has shared that while a standby queue will not be available during the attraction's initial opening days, they expect to open a standby queue soon after the attraction's opening, which sounds like the virtual queue isn't expected to stick around for too long. So if you want to hold out on your big Disney trip to potentially skip that virtual queue hassle altogether, you might be able to do that sooner than you think. Next, let's talk Genie Plus. Disney World has announced that when Tiana's Bayou Adventure opens, it'll be available as part of Disney Genie Plus, just like Splash Mountain was. That means this ride will not have an individual lightning lane. That's right, you can get Tiana's Bayou Adventure in the fun size candy bag. But if you choose this route, make sure you prioritize this lightning lane right when it goes live starting at 7 a.m. because I'm predicting it's going to book up pretty fast. Now, Disney World might be a park for all ages, but that doesn't mean it can't be scary at times. I mean, just think about Disney's animated films. Evil Queen? Scary. Ursula the Sea Witch? Pretty scary. The disappearing Cheshire Cat with his lingering smile? Super, super terrifying. By the way, let me know which Disney film traumatized you the most as a child, and we can all trauma bond together. So it only makes sense that parts of Disney World are also kind of creepy too, especially for the younger kids out there. For the most part, those scary experiences will be pretty easy to spot right off the bat, and I mean they don't call them Haunted Mansion and Tower of Terror for nothing. But other Disney attractions that send your kid into those screen screaming, crying fits may kind of be pretty out of the blue. Growing up, I was a super sensor kid myself, and I always hated any of the lightning or thunder effects on attractions like you can find now at Be Our Guest Restaurant in Magic Kingdom or even Rainforest Cafe in Disney Springs or Animal Kingdom. Even living with the land in Epcot, that thunder situation scared me. I don't know what to tell you. It's true. Now, I was also terrified of those rides with the big blow and pop effects like you'll experience at the end of Journey into Imagination with Figment in Epcot. Basically, the moral here is to know your kids and don't just assume that because this is Disney, your kids will magically become unafraid of the things they're scared of back home. In all honesty, their fears might even be heightened since Disney is a pretty overstimulating place as is. If your kid does get overwhelmed by a ride or experience or even a character, there are quite a few different places inside the parks to help separate them from the overstimulation and take a minute to cool down in the peace and quiet. If you head over to Google and look up DisneyFoodBlog.com, and escape anxiety to access our website posts that feature full lists of places inside the parks where you and your family can go take a break from the crowds and noise and other super sensor triggers, that'll probably be helpful. 
we got a lot of anxiety on our team and a lot of us have, have talked quite a bit in our Slack channels about how, where we go to kind of relax our brains and our bodies when we are in the parks. Okay, if you need an ECV or a stroller or a wheelchair while navigating the parks, Disney World does have these items for rent right past each of the front gates. However, you don't have to rent one of these items from Disney themselves if you don't want to. You may prefer renting from somewhere else entirely. Reliable third-party companies like Buena Vista Rentals and Scooterbug can rent these mobility items to you with prices ranging from $75 to $90 for four to seven days. This could be your best option if you're traveling internationally or you're planning on taking a longer vacation since Disney's rentals can end up costing you a whole lot more in the end. For Disney's ECVs, you'll have to pay $65 per day to use them, and depending on the stroller size or how many days you need the stroller, expect to pay $13 per day for single strollers and $27 per day for double ones. And that's renting them directly from Disney. Not to mention, even if you rent one of these mobility items through Disney directly, you'll still have to return your ECV and stroller to the front of the park before you leave, since these Disney rentals don't transfer between parks. Now that can be a major deal breaker. For example, if I were hopping between Hollywood Hollywood Studios and Epcot, I'd have to return my stroller or ECV to the front of Hollywood Studios before I left, get myself over to Epcot, and pick up my next rental once I arrive there. I just have to show my receipt of purchase to the Epcot rental area so I wouldn't have to pay for the new rental again, but still, you gotta get yourself from Hollywood Studios to Epcot. Imagine if you had a sleeping baby in the stroller or you need that ECV, how are you gonna get over there? So. If you use a rental service, you don't have to worry about dropping off your mobility item and picking up a new one each time you get to a new park. You can just take the same one everywhere you go, even if you venture outside the Disney bubble. Makes it real easy. Other pros to using a third-party rental service? Well, typically they have free delivery services to your hotel, so you don't have to stress over having to track down the rental company yourself before your first park day. You'll also have the option of other ECV and stroller add-ons like rain covers, cup holders, snack trays, and maybe the most important advantage of them all, you can guarantee your ECV or stroller availability. While all mobility rentals from Disney are first come first serve, you can make sure you're all set up for success by ordering your third-party rental ahead of time so you don't have to worry about arriving to the parks on a busy day and finding out that all the ECVs and strollers have already been rented out. As good as this sounds right now, third-party rental sites aren't always the best fit for families. They do tend to be pricier for shorter stays versus just grabbing those rentals in the park for a quick weekend getaway. Plus, many of these rental sites do expect you to be present when they drop off or pick up those mobility items from your resort, which is something you have to factor into your itinerary. At either rate, you do have options that you can look into to make sure you're getting a rental that you feel comfortable with. The only thing that's consistent about Disney is inconsistency. Bet you never heard that one before. Yes, you have. I say it all the time. <laughs> Disney changes all the time, and that goes for its operating hours, too. Park hours change. Show times change. Restaurant hours change. Boy, do restaurant hours change. Whenever it's time for us to update the DFB guide to Walt Disney World Dining, featured over on our DFBstore.com website, by the way, we have to go through each and every Disney restaurant to make sure the times we've currently got listed are still relevant. And each and every time we do this, we have to update a lot of them. But that's why we do what we do. We're trying to save you from misinformation. So please, please, please make sure that before you go on vacation, you're helping us to help you by also researching park hours ahead of your trip. And don't stop there. While you're waiting in line for the rides, use your My Disney Experience app to double check those show times and other various park hours that might have switched up on you while you weren't looking. Disney's been known to update schedules on a whim, and while they usually don't vary too much from what you can typically expect, the slightest change in a schedule could be the difference between seeing a show or missing it entirely. Take Festival of Fantasy over at Magic Kingdom, for example. This is the parade every day. Sometimes it'll happen twice during the day, once at noon, once at three. But then there are the days when you can only catch it at three. And sometimes they move it to two. So what? And how about Fantasmic in Hollywood Studios? Much like Festival of Fantasy, sometimes Fantasmic will show twice in a single evening, sometimes only once. And each show might take place at 8 p.m. or 8.30 or maybe 9. These are only a few examples of the many, many, many showtime changes that Disney switches up on the regular. So make sure you stay on top of things and don't accidentally miss out on a priority experience just because you assumed the times would be the same as they have been in the past. 
Also, quick side note, if you want to pick up our DFB guide to Walt Disney World Dining, which does indeed feature updated information about every single Disney World restaurant on property, then make sure you type in code YouTube before you check out so you can save some extra cash on your purchase. Okay, so some rides might make you regret your outfit choice. And I don't really want to go in depth with how the team and I found this out, this life lesson. Just trust me when I say I'm about to save you from potential major embarrassment during your trip. For the most part, getting off and on Disney World rides is pretty straightforward. You want me to sit in that dune buggy? Cool. Or on a boat bench? Cool, why not? Need me to pull down the overhead restraint before I blast off to an Aerosmith concert? No problemo. But then there are the rides that want to make a fool out of you just because you decided to wear a skirt or a dress. Looking at you, Tron, and Flight of Passage. Both of y'all are a ton of fun, but the fact that we have to sit on you like a bike just spells disaster if we're not wearing the right trousers. And don't think for a second that you're out of the woods, Space Mountain, and Astro Orbiter. The fact that we've got to awkwardly climb in and out of your ride vehicles just lends itself to a little peep show that nobody, not one person, asked for. So if you want to wear a skirt or a cute t-shirt dress during your park day, but you're appropriately afraid of those major wardrobe malfunctions, I'll speak for the class when I say slip shorts can become your best friend. Slip shorts have saved us from a world of embarrassment too many times over when riding the rides and attractions around Disney World since they can be used as a discreet defense under your outfit. And tennis skirts with built-in shorts, also a lifesaver for these kind of situations thanks to their versatility. In the end, just be mindful of what you're wearing in the parks. I know you want to look cute, but you also don't want to compromise yourself, if you know what I mean. Okay, Disney, what have I done to earn this type of favor in your eyes? If you're wanting to do something completely different in Disney World, and quite frankly, a little intimidating, just head over to a resort marina at the Contemporary Beach Club, Yacht Club, Grand Floridian, because these resorts are going to let you rent out their massive pontoon boats for $50 per half hour. Now, each pontoon boat is first come, first serve, so no making reservations ahead of time, and you can have up to 10 people on board at a time. You're also allowed to bring drinks and snacks if you'd like, just as long as it's not alcohol, of course, but Mickey Rice Krispies and stowed away corn dog nuggets are a-okay. The boat rentals start at 11 a.m. each morning, but they do book up fast, so if you want to snag one at the very start of the day, you'll want to get in line probably closer to 10.30 a.m. Once you're at the boat rental window, you'll need to sign some forms, show your ID to prove you're at least 18 years old, if you plan on being one of the drivers, that is, and then you'll have to put on a green wristband showing that you're now 100% boat captain certified. Now here comes the truly shocking part of all of this. A cast member will just hand over the boat keys to you, to one of those $40,000 pontoon boats that you'll be allowed to drive across Disney waters. It is surreal and kind of feels like when you sign that last bit of paperwork for your new car and then you're handed the keys to drive off the lot with it. Oh, I'm sorry, you want me to drive this thing? That's a lot of pressure, but okay, I guess, let's do this. So the thing that makes us feel a little safer about all of this is that there are cast members out on speedboats around the lagoon who are able to help you if you get stuck, sometimes literally, or need to be reprimanded for breaking one of the few rules. So you don't have to worry about wild boat drivers taking scary, dangerous joy rides on the Disney waters because folks will get in trouble if they do anything too careless. Also, it's probably worth mentioning that these boats only have top speeds of five miles per hour. So you're not really gonna move fast enough to actually cause any major trouble, though you still shouldn't go looking for it. And it can be kind of scary when like there's a giant ferry boat coming and you have to get out of the way or, you know, you're trying to figure out what all the signs mean. I don't know. It's stressful. I said we're anxious, right? Anyway, in conclusion, if you're wanting to try a new experience in Disney World and you've always dreamt of driving a sluggish pontoon boat with Cinderella Castle views in the background, this is your chance. Sail away, you wayfinder. Okay, now you're totally equipped to expect the unexpected in Disney World. Feeling powerful? Good, because you should be. Don't forget, if you want a detailed cheat sheet to help you navigate Disney Genie Plus and individual lightning lanes before and during your trip, head over to DisneyFoodBlog.com slash Disney Genie Plus right now so we can get that PDF sent to you immediately. Thanks for listening, everyone, and thanks for watching. I'd love to know the things that you aren't sure people actually realize about Disney World. Love to see those in the comments. As always, this is AJ for Disney Food Blog, and we'll see you real soon.